Good evening, friends. Stephen Benoon here with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research, also Israeli News Live. We're going to air this on Israeli News Live because I feel like anytime you're dealing with this intrusive thought issue, that is something that many, many people need to hear about, they need to know about. And so I thought it no different with you guys this evening as any other group there. Uh, I want to share with you, though, when we're looking, uh, one of the things, uh, before I get into this, uh, what I'm going to be speaking about tonight, I left off on a message a few days ago, uh, maybe a week ago by now, on Genesis 11, talking about uh, this Tower of Babel. And I just happened, and the only reason I'm bringing this up is because I ran across something that I wanted to just share with you, because I mentioned to you when we were doing this video, and let us make let us make us a name of an Asa Lanu Shem. And I I liken that unto they had no doubt discovered uh, when they traveled east, because the word east in Hebrew is something that proceeds. So they no doubt uh, possibly had found the technology of the fallen angels. Uh, I, I think I used some kind of other prehistoric type of uh, technology and they were trying to reverse engineer it. That's where I kind of got the idea from when I uh, when I mentioned this here and uh, and of course not necessarily specifically thinking about the fallen angels at that time. Maybe I mentioned it. I forget now exactly which one I said uh, but I did bring up uh, this fact of, uh, of an earlier technology and the idea too making a name for themselves Kind of like the the idea of uh, Russia, uh, U.S. when we were doing the who gets to the moon first type of race, whoever did. You make a name for yourself. In other words, don't mess with us because if we can go to the moon, we can definitely conquer you as well. That was really the premise. And then, of course, in Genesis chapter 6, uh, I just happened to pop this open. I don't even know why I had it open, but I had it open. And then I came across here, the men of renown. That's what the fallen angels were called, the men of renown. Now, the Hebrew is Anasheh Hashem. And the word Hashem is the name. Basically, the men of the name or the men of renown. In other words, they were considered great, these fallen angels, because they had a name for themselves. This, I believe, is where the idea came from, um, with uh, Nimrod's people at that time, let us make us a name. They wanted to be the Hashem. They wanted to be the the name, the men of renown. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. I just had to share that with you guys. All right, I'm going to quickly make sure the audio is working right because I know I've recorded before. End up not being the audio is recording. Audio is recording. Good. All right, so let's continue on. What we're going to go into is we're going to get into the book of Romans here in just a few moments. But before we do, I wanted to quickly set some of the stage here uh, from 2 Corinthians. And more specifically, verse 5, the 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, the word there, high thing, casting down imaginations. By the way, it's not just something that you imagine in your head. These are literally thoughts. But these thoughts and every high thing, that literally comes from hupsma. It means from a high place or through a barrier, like a dimension, another dimension. So the thoughts can come from different places and they exalt themselves. Those those. Those thoughts that are coming to your head are exalting themselves against the knowledge of God. And, bring, and, and, and Paul is telling you, bring into captivity every thought that, to the obedience of Christ. Now, if we back up verse 2, but I beseech you that I, may not, that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through the God, the pulling down of strongholds. Now, with that in mind, also, let's take a look here. This also, I believe, is in Corinthians, but I forget exactly which chapter. I forgot to put it in there when I did this one here. 
if so that being clothed we shall not be found naked now keep that in mind because this is what we read in genesis when uh adam and eve knew that they were naked okay and by the way genesis uh, i believe it's chapter one and chapter two there's there is a difference in this order chapter two shows the carnal man the physical flesh man being made so there is some um um possibilities of room for other uh considerations in chapter one i'll just leave that at that for right now we'll come back to that later but uh they realize remember when when they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil they realized they were naked so he says here and this is also in corinthians if so be that being clothed we should not be found naked for we that are in this tabernacle do groan talking about our body being burdened not for that we we excuse me not that we would be unclothed but uh, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life now we that hath wrought us for the self same thing as god who also hath given unto us the earnest of the spirit therefore we are always confident in knowing that whilst we are in at home in the body we are absent from the lord now, the whole point that I bring this up here is the human body is very similar to that of a, of, of a house. You have a house, one person could dwell in it, but a whole family could dwell there. Uh, when we look at the maniac of Gadaria, his body being a house was, inha was inhabited by many different demonic spirits. You really don't want anybody else in you, but you and the Holy Spirit, and that's it. But on a daily basis, we're always bombarded in every direction imaginable. That's why Paul speaks here and uh, says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. There's always something coming there for that attack. Now, listen, we're going to be getting into Romans chapter 7 is basically what I want to speak about tonight. And we're going to start back at the beginning, but I want to bring out to you these three verses. I think Paul is the most misunderstood person in Romans uh, chapter 7 of any other teaching he has ever done. He has grossly misunderstood in this chapter so i'm going to try to help you with that let's let's just look at verse 19 20 and 21 for the good that i would i do not but the evil which i would not that i do and a lot of people think automatically uh, you know paul he wants to do good but he just really ain't doing the right thing but he does do the bad things but he really don't want to do the bad things but he's doing them anyway and they justify a life of sin as a result of those words right there in verse 19 and it has nothing to do with what you think. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. There again, there comes that house, right? I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. You're going to find out what the evil is here in just a few minutes. Because we're going to talk about that. All right? And you're probably reading the notes, so you're probably already getting an idea already, so I'm not going to read the notes as of yet. Let's go back to the beginning. Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. And that's true. If you think about it, I mean, there is no reference that I know of in any of the commentators' references about why Paul says this. But the obvious thing is, is yes, the law has dominion only as long as you live. Because under the law, you offer, offer sacrifice for sins. That's the truth of the matter. The law came about to tell you what was right, what was wrong. If you commit this sin, that sin, whatever the case may be, you offer either a turtle dove or an ox or, you know, a goat or a lamb or whatever the case may be for your sins, that has to be offered up. So therefore, as long as you are alive, you must, something must die in your place for the sins that you have committed. That's under the law. You know, as Paul says in another place, guilty of the least is guilty of the whole. So those that try to continue to live under the law, well, 
You're leaving out the sacrificial part. I'm sure some people would argue, well, Jesus is my sacrifice, and I greatly appreciate that if that's your comment to that. But you're bound to the law only as long as you live in the flesh because it is a flesh law. It's not, it's not a spiritual law. It's a law of the flesh. Verse 2, For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress. Though she, continue on here, though she is, uh, uh, excuse me, dead, she, though she be married to another man. All right. That was the law of marriage and divorce under the Old Testament law there. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. That you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. And see, now I put in here the note. That's what I was saying a minute ago. The reason we see death with the law is because when you sinned, an animal had to die. That was your fruit. Offering unto God. But when you are married to Christ, your fruit uh, fruit are, child, are, are children not killing. If you search the scriptures you will find that the fruit of a believer is that you are winning souls to Christ. You're not bringing dead, uh, dead sheep anymore or bringing a little lamb and cutting his throat and watching him bleed and take your place. Now, once you're married to Christ, all things are made new to you and your fruit is life, not death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead, we're in we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the latter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Watch this. Verse 8. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. That's interesting. How could, the law, how could sin be dead without the law? Look at his words that he used here. The word occasion there is from a, 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 for, a form, I think is how you pronounce that, which is basically where an attack comes from. But sin, take an occasion by the commandment. All right. In other words, how does sin get to us? The attack comes from the commandment. Watch. Wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. What is a concupiscence? A longing for what is forbidden. Notice what Adam and Eve, what happened with them, right? God said... There was that tree of knowledge of good and evil. He said, don't look at it, don't touch it, don't do anything with it. Now, before he said that, they probably didn't pay any attention to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But once God said, don't have anything to do with it, you can eat of all the other trees, but don't touch this one right here, then there was that longing. What is it that I'm missing right here? Actually, before that, they had the law of Christ in them. When Paul talks about that's something I find very interesting. Paul makes that comment, for without the law, sin was dead. The law came through the knowledge of good and evil, because that's what the law is. It is the knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. And when Adam and Eve, if they just went by the things that they were allowed to eat and everything and didn't have to go by, oh, you can't touch this tree right here, they wouldn't have thought nothing of that tree. That's what Paul is speaking about when he says it wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. Then you long for that which is not right. 
He says, for I was alive without the law once. That's talking about Adam and Eve. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Because once you had all these do's and don'ts, then you get curious. Well, what happens if I do do this? You probably never would have thought nothing of it. Coveting your neighbor's wife. Or his ox. Or his ca uh, camel. Or whatever the case may be. Might not have never thought about it had there not been the actual law that says don't do that. So he says, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Because the commandment could not free us from sin. And as long as the commandment was there, it required death, which was the death of the animal. Now when Christ came, it required his death as well, yes. But his death, once and for all, settled everything. Let's read on. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it, it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Even though it becomes exceedingly sinful, though, it becomes also more enticing. That's what Paul is talking about. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. As I noted here, verse 15 seems very confusing to most until we really break it down. Let's see how we break it down then. Verse 16, if then I do... That which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. The first and last sentence in verse 15 is Paul admitting to keeping or doing the law, which he shows he does not allow, meaning the Gentiles and he hates because the fruit is death. All right, let me, let me read that again. The first and last sentence in verse 15 is Paul admitting to keeping the law, all right, for that which I do, I allow not, all right, what he does, he's keeping that law, which he shows he does not allow, he, do, he does, he, you know, he wants you to be in Christ is what I'm saying here, meaning to the Gentiles, and he hates because, and when I say unto the Gentiles, when he goes to the Gentiles, if you remember, all right, watch what he says, for that which I do, I allow not. Why does it say he allows not? You remember the story when they brought before him about the issue of the Gentiles, about whether or not they should keep the law, whether they should circumcise or not circumcise, etc. And he said, do not put such burdens upon them. With the exception of abstaining from, from blood and things like that. He said, other than that, don't put any more burdens on them. So he says, for that which I do, in other words, he as a Jew, he kept the law, but he didn't allow it. That's what he's talking about. What I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If I then do that which I would not, I consider to the law that it is good. There's your cute uh, clue right there. I consent unto the law that it is good. See, if then I do that which I would not, what, what is he doing? It's keeping the law. That's how you know it. Verse 16. All right. Now, let's go to the next verse. Verse 17. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. All right. 
I write the note here. For the good I would refers back to verse 15. But clearly the good is not the law. But the evil which I would not, that I do is clearly the law. Or the breaking of the law which has enticed him as mentioned in verse 8. All right, let's look, let's go back and look at that verse 8 again. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. That's where he does that. See, that's where he gets into that. All right, so he says, For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. So, as we said here, for the good I would refers back up to verse 15. All right. Here we go right here. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But I, but what I hate, that I do. So, it, it seems confusing as all get out. I do. I know what you what you think when you look at that. That's why I'm trying to really break this down so it makes more sense to you. So he says, but clearly the good is not. The, or I say this here. But clearly the good is not the law. But the evil which I would not that I do is clearly the law or the breaking of the law which has enticed him as mentioned in verse 8. All right, when I say enticing, because he says it brought about him in all concupiscence. In other words, he knows the law now that he's just enticed to want to break the law. That's why he hates it. It's not that per se I'd say that Paul hated the law, but he hated the fact that now he knows the law so he has to do it. He feels compelled to do it. But he also teaches others not to do it. Speaking about the Gentiles. For them not to do it. Because he doesn't want to put that burden upon them. Because he hates it. Because being bound under the law. Causes you to want to break it even that much more. Right? Now watch verse 20. Now if I do that I would not. It is no more I that do it. But sin that dwelleth in me. Now we're getting into a different issue altogether. He says, now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now I write, make a note. Paul says it is sin that dwells in him. Genesis 4, we read that sin lurks at the door. When Adam does wrong, the very Hebrew word is like a four-legged animal creeping around. So when Paul says, now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Remember, like I said, your body is a house. And in your body, like a house like I live in, my wife lives here. My daughter lives here. We even got cats and dogs here. Chickens, but they don't normally hang around in the house. But uh, ducks, etc. But we do have the cats and the dogs will come inside. And they're the four-legged creatures. But the thing is, do you can you control everybody's movements that live in the house? No. That's why Paul says, now if I do that, I would not. It is no more that I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now we're starting to look at the whole idea of the intrusive thoughts. Intrusive thoughts, just like in the case of Genesis, you know, God said to Adam when he sinned, he said, now sin crouches at the door. The door is the door of your house. Paul said in that other uh, scripture there in Corinthians, I mentioned to you, bringing every thought in, in every imagination, as it says there, but it's actually even thoughts. And it all goes on to say that comes from, from high places, literally other dimensions, thoughts and things coming in, coming into your house, your body, and breaking the commandments. Because that's what Paul says. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. See, he doesn't want to break those commandments. But he realizes that there's something else that he's battling again against that's creating this problem. Verse 21, I find then a law 
that when I would do good, evil is present with me. I made the note here. This law is so true. Anytime you try to fulfill the righteous fruit of God, bringing in souls, because that's what the fruit is supposed to be now. Our fruit now is not bringing up an animal to kill the animal because of the sin that we've, that we've committed. But now our fruit is to win souls to Christ. But, bring, but bringing righteous fruit of God, bringing in souls, life to the kingdom, Satan is there with the law of death trying to entrap you by the law itself, the concupiscence. I put that in there, the law itself, the concupiscence, because the law, as Paul said, creates that concupiscence. It creates that desire to just want to do something wrong. But not only that, as Paul mentions here in verse 20, now if I do that, I would not. It's, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. No wonder why the scripture says, casting down every thought, every imagination that exalts itself above God or the knowledge of God. If there's any way I could really get you to understand, those of you that are suffering, that, that feel, especially in light of the idea of the law, right? When you're looking at the law, because we have a lot of people out there that listen in that are Hebrew roots, etc. And I'm not here to knock you or nothing like that. I'm, I want to help you. And a lot of people knock Paul because they say, oh, Paul was just trying to tear the law up. But the thing is, is are you married to Christ? Are you married to the law? Paul said, I espouse you a virgin, a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, the thing is, you can choose. Paul actually kept the law. And we know this even by his own, by the very things that he did. He did keep the law. Even though he tells you clearly in the book of Hebrews, for example, and there's those that argue that Paul didn't even write the book of Hebrews, so if you want to throw that at his feet, there's argument that he didn't write it. I don't know if I can agree with that, but I understand the argument. Let's just put it that way. I understand the argument. The thing is, when we read in Romans 7, he was keeping the law, but he was also not so much encouraging the people to keep it. All right, let's finish up before, and I'll back up. I want to go over some things with you. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's what he really wanted. That was the law of love that Jesus Christ brought. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. You see, when he's talking about that captivity to the law of sin, he's talking about the law. The 613 mitzvot, as we say in Hebrew, the mitzvot, the commandments of God. See, he says he's warring against the law of his, in my mind, bringing me into captivity, the law of sin, which is in my members. In other words, Paul had been taught to such a degree as a Pharisee to keep the law that he literally was battling that because he felt compelled that he had to do that. But at the same time, he's trying to free you that you don't. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, I made the note here. Because God gave the law through Moses as a result of the fall in the garden, it is this law that we war against because of the flesh. But it is the law in our hearts that saves us through Jesus Christ. Who I should so so I put so died to the law. It's the dialogue of the former husband and be free in Christ. Because that's what Paul is really trying to teach you here. All right, so let's back up a little bit on this here, right? Verse 7, but what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. In other words, if he didn't know the law... He wouldn't even be thinking of it. Because what does it say in the scriptures also? The Gentiles do by nature those things contained in the law. So he saw that. It was a law unto themselves. They didn't need somebody to say, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. They just did it. 
But once you know that it's a law, then it's just like you got to break it. Like a little kid. You tell the little kid, right? You could you could set something up there for the little child that, that he ain't supposed to touch. You know, let's set some electrical outlet outside. And you say, whatever you do, Johnny, now don't you go playing by that little electric outlet box there, right? And little Johnny would have never paid no attention to it until you said that. And now every time he goes by, he remembers what you said. Now he just can't wait to go stick something in that light socket. That's what Paul's talking about here in verse 8. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin took an occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it it slew me. He said, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin working death in me that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. See, he's showing you oh, there's a purpose for it. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. No joke, right? For what? For that which I do, I allow not. In other words, I keep, he keeps the commandment of God, but he tells the Gentiles, don't do that. For what I would, that do I not. In other words, he would like to be free like you and not be bound by that law. But what I hate, that I do. You see, we've been thinking all along, and I used to be thinking the same thing, you know. In other words, Paul was like, oh God, boy, you know, he wants to do right, but he's always doing bad things, and he just can't help, he's got to do bad things, and... We, and we just justify every little sin we did because of this right here. That's not what he's talking about. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. There's your key right there. Verse 16. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. So he's, now, he's, now he is trying to show you at the same time, even though he's keep trying to keep that law, he's still making mistakes left and right. But he realized it's not him making those mistakes. There's something inside of his flesh, in his body, that is bringing him into that bondage of breaking that commandment. And it's not himself. And he knows that. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. He wants to do right, but he can't find, just to get over that, right? For the good that I would do, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. He keeps seeing his body make those mistakes. He keeps seeing this make those mistakes. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Wow. That's why I looked it up in the Hebrew as well. The word sin. See, what, 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 what is it? See, Paul says it is sin that dwells in him. In Genesis 4, we read that sin lurks at the door. When Adam does wrong, the very Hebrew word is like a four-legged animal creeping around. Oh, talk about the serpent dwelling at the tent door, buddy. That's what's going on. Now, does that give you a green light to just go out there and do everything that's bad and all that kind of stuff and say, oh, the devil did it. It was the devil that did it in me. No, it doesn't mean that. But every little thought that comes to your mind that is sitting there trying to bind you up is not you. That's what you've got to wake up to. It's not you. I would say more than Probably 65, 70% of the thoughts that hit your brain daily are not even you. And as he says, where was that one at there, right? Um, I think that's actually when we get into Corinthians. Let me find it real quick again for you again. Uh, yeah, here we go. Hoopsama, I think, is the one here. Yeah. Casting down imaginations and every high thing. That hoopsama. It means from a high place or through a barrier. Another dimension. Those 
those thoughts are just being pumped into your head every day. You know how many people I've dealt with that get suicidal thoughts? You might be listening to this video right now. And that might, and, I, and look, I'm not, this is no, I ain't got no revelation that somebody's going through this, but I realize thousands of people are going to hear this video. We know from iConnect FX, based on the way they do their, the counting of the, of the views, what YouTube shows on there, you're getting, I used to say 10 times, it's actually, we, fit, we found out through iConnect, six times the views of what you see there. So if I do have a video that does 30,000 views, that is 180,000 people we know have seen that video. 180,000. YouTube don't want you knowing. That's why I say, if you've so subscribed to the channel, resubscribe. Make sure you're subscribed. They take it down. I want to send YouTube a message that we're going to grow whether they suppress us or not. Resubscribe. Resubscribe. You know, I, I, I look at it. They say 300 and some people grew in the last month. Yeah, and they took off, what, five, 600? I know that people don't unsubscribe that that and those and that types of droves. That's nonsense and a lie. That's YouTube unsubscribing you. They don't even allow you to get notifications. Some do, some don't. Most of you don't. Figure that one, right? It's not just what I say in the news. They don't want you knowing. They don't want you to know this either. Paul said, "Every time I try to do good, evil is not." Through those dimensions. Oh, let me go back to that suicide thing, though. There's a lot of people that have that bombard their mind. That they should just take their life. They might feel that because they're afraid they might hurt somebody else. That's not you. But you'll think it's you. That spirit uses your voice and talks to you. And no, it doesn't make you evil. I know there's people that teach that, oh, that's the unpardonable sin. Prove it. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because a person took their own life? That's totally nonsense. There's no such thing. That's not scriptural. My great-grandmother used to tell me the same thing. Sure, the idea was is that they figured, oh, you didn't have time to repent because you took your own life. How do we know what happened? How do you know if the person didn't shoot themselves, they're laying on the floor there, they got a few seconds before they passed away and everything. Do you know 30 seconds still in this life could be two hours in the presence of Almighty God. There is that one man from Australia. Actually, he wrote me one time, or we wrote. I wrote him and he responded back. I forget his name now, but he was some kind of jellyfish had stung that man. And he was dying. He went to the other side and got to meet with Jesus. He talked about the love. He said, even though he said he said he wasn't a Christian, but his mother was praying for him. And when he was given the opportunity to either come or go back, he said to Jesus, he said, I have to go back because my mother will never know that I made it. And he saw her praying for him. Don't give up on people just because something bad goes wrong. See, people are bombarded every day with thoughts like you would not believe. That's why I feel so compelled to do messages about this right now. I'm going to go into being born again as well very soon. Just some real fundamental basics of becoming a real believer in Jesus Christ. But listen, the thing is, and I know it's not easy, when you get bombarded by thoughts continuously, and let's say you've, you know, the enemy has just really been hitting on you for a long time on this, you got to basically pull up your suspenders, so to speak, and you got to make a stand. You got to cast down that imagination. You got to say, I'm done with this. No more.
I've had enough. And you take control. See, the thought you're not going to stop the thoughts from coming. You ain't going to stop that little devil from crouching at your door, coming in to this physical body and loading it up with every kind of thought imaginable. It might be perverted thoughts. It might be smack your neighbor. I mean, how many times? Seriously. I mean, think. I, I want you to really think about this for a minute. How many times you're just sitting there in a store or a restaurant and somebody's a little bit loud and everything, thought comes in your mind, go smack them. Now, you don't do it because you wouldn't do it. Some people will. Some people get bombarded so much and they don't even think nothing about it. They're, they're, they're not looking at this from the, from the perspective of a Christian. They just, whatever comes to their head, well, either they might do it or they might not do it. That's why you see so much violence going on in the world today. Remember I told you the intel that I was, I was given about you know, crimes are going to be up, everything else. In fact, I'm going to be doing a news broadcast here in a little bit. Tucker Carlson over on, um, uh, gosh, Elon Musk's channel there has been putting out some very interesting videos. And again, a lot of the intel that I had been sharing with you guys for a long time on Israeli News Live, also over on our Patreon channel, spot on. Wait till I share some of that with you. Anyway, listen, I, I got to come back to that suicide thing one more time. Push that idea out of your head. That's not you. I don't care how much it's your voice. It's not you. You got a family. You have people that love you. And I don't care how much that spirit tries to tell you. Nobody loves you. That is a lie straight out of hell. There are those that do love you. And there is someone in your life that you would absolutely devastate by taking that step that you're thinking about doing. And I'll clarify that. That's not you thinking about doing it. That's a that's an evil spirit that has put that thought in your mind and they've gotten you to believe it. Your first step is recognize it didn't come from you. In fact, if you go back to when those thoughts first came to you, you'll realize it seemed foreign to you. But over time, you have believed it. Don't believe it. Don't believe it any longer. I know I'm speaking to somebody now. I'll, I'll put comments on controlled so we can we can approve them in case there's somebody that needs to write something. And if I need to write you, if nothing else, you can just tell me in the comments. Brother Steve, write me. I, I really need to speak with you. All right, and I'll do it. Um, we're in a late hour, friends. And we need to encourage one another more than we've ever encouraged one another before. And listen, you may listen to this broadcast for the news only. And for maybe for some reason, you just stuck it out this time and decided to listen to this video. Um, that's, what the, that's what Israeli News Live was originally. We were not Israeli News Live. We were Danun Institute. We ended up creating a separate channel just for teaching there. But this, this channel... More than 200,000 subscribers came on board before we ever went into the news. So when you listen and you, you, you're like, oh, brother, I don't need that, or Steve, I don't need that. I enjoy your, your news perspectives. Just stick with that. Um, I, I understand the way you feel. and uh, But I feel sometimes in my heart people need to hear this. And maybe you just happen to be here and you, did, you stuck it out anyway, you know. If there's something I could help you with because maybe you felt like this really ended up being for you, you may not be a Christian and you may, you know, I mean, listen, I've got Muslim friends, I've got Hindu friends, all kinds of friends that watch this broadcast for the news content. I don't judge you for whatever you believe, that's up to you. But I do know we're coming down to the wire here 
we really are. I say that sincerely. This is no time to be playing church. And I, that's one thing I don't do. I don't play church. I'm not a denomination. Uh, you know, if you want to go to denomination, I don't condemn you for that either. That's it's whatever God lays on your heart. For me, I just, I'll tell you what I feel in my heart and do all I can to help you. And if you feel God lays on your heart, you want to support the work we do, we thank you for it. That's all I'll say. Our email address not our email address, but our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org, is right above my head. And the mailing address, if you want to donate by mail, is there as well. We thank you, and God bless you for that. Anyway, you have a great evening. I'll stop talking now. I'm talking too much as it is. And uh, and we'll talk again soon, friends.